Thanks for joining us today. At City Life, we have one purpose, making it easy for people to say yes to Jesus. We believe today's message will empower you to do exactly that. But remember that church is so much more than a sermon you listen to. It's a living, breathing community that we invite you to be a part of. We hope to see you on a Sunday morning at City Life. This morning into the animal kingdom. How many of you are animal lovers? Oh, I am not. This is not, <laughs> this is, um, not why we're doing this. In fact, I'm terrible with animals, and it's not, I am not an expert on animals at all. We tried the whole pet thing as parents, and it did not go well. You know, we tried the fish thing, fish dies. We tried the hamster thing, did not know they were nocturnal. And so, you know, that, you know, the kids are like, why can't we play the hamsters? Because they're hiding all day long under the shavings. And then at night you hear the little, ch -ch 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 -ch, like this wheel going all night long. You know, we didn't know that they could escape the cage and um, that they could get into really weird places like the furnace vents. Oh, yeah. You're like, and then like three weeks, it's like the poor little buddy had been missing. And we thought, oh, one of the kids left the back door open only to have the, what is that smell when the furnace kicks on? Oh, yeah, it was not a good. So we don't do pets in our house. They don't survive, which is why we don't have one that would really be devastating like a dog to lose. Poor thing. But so we're going to look, though. So we're going to look at a little critter today that's not exactly your typical cuddly critter. Um, but we, I actually think, and I think you're going to see too, that this little critter, you actually have more in common with this animal than what you might think. In fact, if there was a spirit animal for the entire human race, this animal would probably be it. Now you might be thinking an eagle or a horse or some other powerful animal. Oh no. The animal we're looking at today is Mr. Porcupine. Oh yeah, Mr. Porcupine. Not exactly Mr. Cuddly. They have over 30,000 quills on their body. They are also nocturnal animals who live most of their time alone. They don't do crowds. Whenever, if you've ever seen a porcupine, there's usually not a herd of them or a group of them. It's actually called a prickle of porcupines. There's no, go figure, hey? So if you've ever seen, usually you just see one and it's often roadkill on the middle of the highway, somewhere or a back road. So they're, they're kind of isolated, they're by themselves. And porcupines typically have two approaches to relationships. They either withdraw or attack. If an animal or something else comes near it, they either run up a tree, like go figure, they can actually climb trees very well, or they, they quill you. They don't shoot their quills. They actually got to get close enough and they like swipe around and they have to, you have to get close to them, but they release their quills if you get too close. But here's the thing. Porcupines don't want to be alone. They long for love just like every other animal does. But their dilemma, how to get close without getting hurt. Anybody relate to the porcupine? Anybody wonder how they mate? <laughs> oh, yes. If you have children in here, that's why they should be in voltage. <laughs> Intimacy, as you can imagine, poses some challenges for the porcupine. So one of the biggest challenges is there is not a lot of time to invest in building a lifelong relationship with the porcupine. There is a very short window of time when the female is actually even interested. It happens once a year, usually in October, for an eight to 12 hour period. Yeah, talk about little window of time. You think you don't have much time on your life? Mr. Porcupine has even less. You know why? 
You know what even makes this more discouraging? Is that their short little legs, they waddle. That's like, they, they're big. They got these big bulky bodies and these short little legs, which makes them really slow waddlers. And what happens is he's got to cover a lot of territory in a short amount of time because usually they have an acre, they have like 250 acres of territory. The Mr. Porcupine has to waddle as fast as he can in that one little window once a year in October in that eight to 12 12 hour window to try to find her. But they have found a way to be together. How does this work? You might be wondering. In October, she sends a pheromone signal. And all the males in the area waddle as fast as they can to where she's at. And then they have a vicious battle to see who the lucky guy is that gets to mate with her. I know, it's crazy. Unlike the rest of the animal kingdom, you cannot force a porcupine to mate with you. If she's just not that into you, she will let you know. She will scream, she will bite, she will like swipe you with her tail, and then she'll run away. So what does Mr. Porcupine do? He needs to persuade her. Everyone say persuade. He has to persuade her because her no is the most respected no in the animal kingdom. How does he persuade her? He's got one move. Guess what it is? He pees on her. <laughs> I am not making this up. But this is a cool part. Then they do the porcupine dance. They get on their high legs and they kind of, their paws kind of come up like this and they're kind of like, wah, 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 and they kind of, wah, wah, and they kind of go back and forth. And they're kind of like, as you can see, you can't get too close because you're like, I want to get close, but I got to get quilled and I want to get close and I'm going to get quilled. And so they kind of go back and forth like this. And after a while, she's like, oh, you're not so bad. You're kind of cute. And so then they make the most of the short amount of time they have together. And boom, the porcupine race continues. Isn't that amazing? So here's the thing. If you've ever seen a porcupine, you have seen a miracle. You don't believe in miracles? If you have seen a porcupine, even if it's in the zoo, you have seen a miracle in nature. Now, this might be hilarious and probably the weirdest message you have ever heard in church. <laughs> but there is a point. Everyone say point. <laughs> point. Because when it comes to community and connection, we actually aren't much different than the porcupine. We all have our little arsenal of quills. And most of our approaches to relationship are to attack. And sometimes we attack without meaning to because we have quills like rejection or anger or envy or social awkwardness or pride. And we quill those who try to get close. Or we withdraw, we isolate, we pull back because we don't want to get quilled and we don't want to accidentally quill somebody else and then it'll be really bad. And many of us, like the porcupine would say of relationships, I don't have time. It's just too much effort to try to waddle, to try to find somebody to connect with. It's just too painful. It's too dangerous. It's too risky. I tried before and I got quilled. I want you to say this with me. Everyone say, getting close is worth the risk. Here's another one. If a porcupine can do it, so can I. <laughs> if a porcupine can do it, so can we. Now, the connection and the community that we're talking about in the house of God, in church, because that's where we're at. We're not just talking about animals mating, although that is kind of funny. You will never see another porcupine the same again. But this connection in this community we're talking about isn't what you get in a big group gathering like we are in now. Now, this big group gathering is actually vital for you. It's so important. But this big group gathering, we call it rows. And rows are actually really important for our lives, especially if you consider yourself a follower of Jesus. And even if you don't consider yourself a follower of Jesus, this environment is really good for you because that's where you discover your story. But see, in this bigger environment, rows is actually really important because it reminds us our lives are connected to a bigger picture. We aren't just building our own life. We actually aren't just building our own little family. Our life 
is connected to something called God's bigger story and God's purpose that he's working out through us together in this collection, in this community called the church. God doesn't work his purpose out through you as an individual. His purpose is outworked through us together. Everyone say together. It's through together. And so we need these rows, but there's a lot that doesn't show in a row because nobody knows in a row how you are doing. You can come in, you can sit in your row every Sunday and be, I'm smiling, I will distract myself on my phone so nobody talks to me and they think I'm busy. Nobody knows how you're doing. You can come in and nobody knows whether you're doing great or you're drifting or even worse, if you're actually in trouble, you're in a bad place and you need rescuing. Nobody knows that in a row. You need a circle. And you know, in church, we call circles groups. Now, if you look at how the church started, if you look at the early church, it had both rows and groups. They met every day in the temple. They met every day house to house. They had both. Everyone say both. Both. And see, we need the connection in a smaller community within the house of God. We need a connection to it. You might have all sorts of connections out there, but you need a connection within a smaller community in God's church because it's different than clubs. It's different than the sports teams you're on or your kids are on. It's different than this knitting club or this art club or whatever it is because those things might be good, but they might not have the life transforming factor of the life and power of Jesus Christ as the center or gathering point. We need community, smaller community within the life of the church. So, why groups? Well, if you're actually going to follow Jesus, it means you're going to be different. And you know, there was a very brilliant man by the name of the Apostle Paul, and he was writing to these communities all out throughout the Mediterranean, explaining to them what God was doing when the church was starting. And he was telling them about how to live as Jesus followers in a culture that was actually probably more ruthless than our culture when it came to your faith. You might think it's tough in the world that we live in. Nobody you know in Alberta, whether you live in Leduc, Edmonton, Wetaskiwin, St. Albert, Sherwood Park, Spruce Grove, Millet, wherever you're at, probably none of your friends are being thrown to lions to be eaten alive because of their faith, right? No, none of your friends are being thrown in prison here in Alberta for their faith. And so the culture that the church started in was a culture that was so even more ruthless than ours. But this pertains to us today. And Paul explained it this way. He said, here's the challenge of following Jesus. And I think it relates just as much today. While we might not have physical lines and we might not have a prison that's threatening or any other form of threatening to kill us physically, then he's actually a little bit more subtle because he's an unseen enemy. And he doesn't go for your body. He's going for your soul. And you can actually miss the lion that's roaring for your soul. You can actually miss the prison and not see the prison you're already in, in your soul. Because this is what's happened. Paul said in Romans 12, too, in in one translation, he said, don't let the world around you squeeze you into its own mold. Have your, has your soul been squeezed into the mold? of the culture that you live in. See, our world wants to constantly squeeze us into its own mold. And it's not the way God designed us to live, and it's not the way he designed us how to live or for even for what. We need the strength of a circle. See, if you imagine the world come trying to squeeze you into its mold, if you are surrounded in a circle, that circle becomes a buffer to that squeeze. It becomes like a force field to the squeeze of the world, of the culture that we live in that would try to squeeze your soul into a mold that it was never meant to function in as a human being. What does the mold look like? And how can you avoid getting squeezed into it? Well, I want to show you. I just got four things. I'm going to show you today. We're going to look at four 
powerful forces that community builds into your life and how it can save you and the type of squeeze it can save you from. Are you ready? Everyone said four. Four. So here we go. Here's the first powerful force that community builds into your life. Community builds togetherness that saves you from the squeeze of autonomy. Now, what is autonomy? Autonomy is I know what's best for me. I don't need anybody else. I am good on my own. The only problem with that, that's not how humans were made to live. And see, autonomy was the only thing that God said was not good in his good creation. You can read about it in Genesis chapter 2, Genesis 1, 2, and 3. But autonomy was also the thing that destroyed God's good creation. When the first two humans said, we know what's best, and they chose self over God. And that's what broke everything. Autonomy is destructive. Why is autonomy a dangerous squeeze for us today? Well, here's why. You might know a bit about what's good for you, but you don't know everything about what's good for you. Because we don't know what we don't know. We don't know what we don't know. I think we need to say, say, I don't know what I don't know. Some of you are like, huh? It's like, just let it sink in for a minute. You'll get it if you haven't already. We don't know what we don't know. You don't know something. You don't know that you don't know it, right? You don't even know it exists out there. So you don't know what you don't know. And you could be missing that thing that is absolutely what you need, but you don't know you need it because you don't know what you don't know. So you might know something about what's good for you, but we don't know everything about what's good for us. I know one of the things, I remember even my own experience in groups. You know what I discovered about me in groups that I didn't know? I have certain personality quirks that aren't conducive to good relationships. <laughs> you find that out in a group. I have not conquered them all yet, but I'm more aware of them and working on them more diligently. But you don't find that out until you're in a group. With people who are like, uh, you know what you just did over there? That actually really didn't work well with that other person. You know what else I've discovered in groups? A weird idea I had about God was actually not right. God was better than what I thought he was. You know what else I discovered about in a group? I discovered that my idea and my perception of that certain type of person was completely wrong and actually hurtful. Because I found myself sitting beside them in a group and recognized, oh, those kinds of people aren't that bad. You know what else I discovered in a group? That the things in my life that made me feel so trapped, I didn't even realize I was in a trap. Somebody else had actually been through that and learned how to get free. And they helped me walk that out too. Everyone say, I need a group. God created a human-shaped void in us that he himself will not fill. There is a God-shaped void that we're made with that only he can fill, but there is a human-shaped void that God himself will not fill. You cannot just do the me and Jesus thing. You can't do the me and Rose thing because nobody knows in a row. You need a group. Here's the second thing. Number two, community builds intention that saves us from isolation. There is a very powerful disease in our world today called isolationitis. And there are a lot of things that contribute to it. We won't get into that today, but there's actually two different types of isolationitis. There's a typical form where we are just surrounded by people all day. We work on people. You might have like a crazy commute, commute, commute with a lot of people. You might be scheduled up the yin yang and you got so many things. You're going to this activity with the kids and you're going to that activity. And you're just like by the end of the day and the end of the week, you're just like, Meh, get away from me, humans. Or there's also functional isolationitis, where we actually do life with people. We're surrounded by people, but we just have surface level relationships. One of the biggest contributing factors, I think, is social media to this, because we have a lot of connections and a lot of acquaintances, but we are known by none. And we actually don't really know people. We need that intention that saves us from the squeeze of isolation. And see, when we live in isolation-itis, we start to disconnect. 
And when we're disconnected, just like a boat that gets disconnected from the dock, it starts to drift. And we start to drift. And you know what happens when you drift? Because the world that we live in is broken, we never drift into anything good. We go with the current of a broken world that drifts into bad. How many of you have ever drifted into a good diet? No. We drift to donuts and french fries and winging it wings and every other sort of lusciousness that's out there. How many of you ever drifted into a 5 a.m. workout? Not. Never. Come on, you don't drift into a good marriage. You don't drift into good friendships. We always drift to what's bad. So if we're disconnected, we will never drift into anything good. We will always drift into the danger zone. And that's why Hebrews 2, 1 in the Passion, it says, this is a writer was again speaking to the early church in a really squeezing time. This is why it's so crucial, he said, that we be all the more engaged and attentive. Those are intentional words. All the more engaged and attentive to the truths that we have heard so that we do not drift off course. We don't want to drift. See, when you're in community, you're less likely to drift into a clouded perspective. Because when you're by yourself, man, everything looks worse than it is or better than it is. And then you make like stupid decisions. But when we start, we start drifting, we get into funky thinking. We need people around us to say, smack, that is so dumb. Like, why are you thinking that way? Been there, done that? We need, you're less likely to drift into real trouble. You know, the enemy he works, he isolates. And when you're surrounded, it's, you're less likely to become a victim of a very real enemy that wants to bring your downfall. You know what else you're less likely to drift into? Poor health. Get this, they've done research that people with really bad eating habits and really bad health habits, we're talking like smoking, drinking, like all the stuff that's really bad for your physical body. Those people, even with their bad health habits, if they're surrounded by a community of good, healthy relationships, actually live longer than people who are really healthy but live disconnected. So you are better to eat Twinkies with friends than broccoli by yourself. Everyone said thank you for the Twinkies. All right, we gotta hurry up. Community, here's number three. Community builds hope that saves you from negativity. See again, the culture, the world that we live in is so good at telling us who and what we're not. We need to be reminded of who and whose we actually are. And you know, most of us in this room, many of us probably had at least one person sometime in our life that believed in us. Maybe it was something as small as, I believe that you can pass the test. I believe that you can clean your room today. I believe, I believe, maybe it was a big thing. I believe you're gonna win. I believe you're gonna finish. I believe you're gonna do this. I believe, you know, this marriage is gonna work. I believe this relationship is a, it's gonna work. We've, we've had that, and that, that is such a powerful thing, that somebody speaking that kind of hope and speaking to our potential. But here's the other part of that. We need to believe in others. We need to be the one speaking to others' potential. We need to be the one speaking hope into others because that's how hope grows. Hope is a cycle. We receive it, but then we've got to give it out. And if we don't, then hope gets stuck. And hope is like a currency that keeps us from being overcome by the negative, all the crap, and this disaster, and the economy's this, and this is the doom, and this is the way it's heading, and the government this, and the government that. I am so tired of hearing about why things are so wrong. We need to be hope, those that cycle hope and continue to create hope. And that's why, man, we need that intentional telling and reminding each other of who we really are and reminding each other the bigger story that we are a part of, that this world is not all there is because that's how hope grows. We need that community builds hope that prevents you from getting overcome by the squeeze of negativity. Number five, com- number four, community builds belonging that saves you from the squeeze of guilt and shame. And guilt and shame are two of the most powerful voice- forces that cause us to run and hide. Guilt is there's some, I've done something wrong. And shame is I am wrong. And see, both of those cause us to hide. But both of those are actually what Jesus died 
to free us from. I want to read Hebrews 10, 21 to 25. And whoever's on keys, you can come up now and get ready to play. Hebrews 10, 21. Since we now have a magnificent king priest to welcome us into God's house, we come closer to God and approach him with an open heart, fully convinced by faith that nothing will keep us at a distance from him. For our hearts have been sprinkled with blood to remove impurity, and we've been freed from an accusing conscience, and now we are clean unstained and presentable to God inside out. So now we must cling tightly to the hope that lives within us, knowing that God always keeps his promises. I love all of the now words. Not someday you're going to be better. Not someday you're going to be forgiven. Not someday you're going to be purified. No, today. Everyone say today. Now. Our hearts have been sprinkled. This isn't something we do. This is what Jesus has done. This is the why of communion that Melissa so powerfully explained it's the blood of Jesus has cleansed us and we take that juice as representing his blood to remind us it ain't by my own good works that I can clean up my crap I need the blood of Jesus who has already done that but look at this other part of the verse discover creative ways to encourage others and to motivate them toward acts of compassion towards doing beautiful works as expressions of love. This is not the time to pull away and neglect meeting together as some have formed the habit of doing because we need each other. And I love how it's like exclamation point. We need each other. In fact, we should come together even more frequently eager to encourage and urge each other onward as we anticipate that day dawning. Why do we need to come together in a group, in a community that's built and centered on Jesus Christ in some way, shape, or form? This is because there is life transforming and liberating power in that gathering. You cannot live free and strong doing your own thing with Jesus. We need this gathering. So, here's what we want you to do. We all have reasons why we can't do community, why we can't do groups. Don't have enough time. I don't have enough energy. It takes a lot to waddle. Don't you see how I'm waddling? I have a huge territory, 250 acres to be exact. I have a very short window of time in my weekly schedule. Besides, I don't even know where they're at. I have my quills. I do not want to get quilled. We have all the friends we need. I am fine with my little prickle of porcupines. <laughs> but this is what we're asking. We all have reasons why not, but this is what we're asking. Will you give it a try? Will you help build life-giving life-transforming community. Will you be it and will you build it for yourself and for others? So you might already have plenty of friends in your life, but you have no idea the provisional relationships God could be bringing through those doors this Sunday, next week. I'm going to tell you, my parents, I love this. One of the coolest examples from their own life, they're in their 70s and my dad turned 76 yesterday. But one of the things in their later life, one of their closest friends is a couple that is about my age that they met only when my mom and dad would have been about in probably 20 years ago. So in their late, late fifties or maybe even early sixties, maybe it was even more recent than that, where this couple, they met them and they have been one of the most provisional, strongest encouragers in this sphere, in this time in their life. My dad's health hasn't been great for the last several years and they've been so connected. They were a provisional relationship. My parents in their late fifties, even sixties, we got all the friends we need, let alone someone decades younger than 20, 20 years younger than them. But that was a provisional relationship that they established later in life. You have no idea who your new provision, your friends are going to be that are going to carry you into the next season. And, and so, you know what? There's a lot of you who might have been here at Heart and Soul, but we've got a brand new format with Connect Groups. And you can find out about it more on the app. Everyone say the app. And if you don't have the new City Life app, you need to go to the bathroom, look at how to download it on one of those little things there. There's different places at the different table somebody will help you if you don't have it and you're having problems just find somebody say, I need to figure out the app 
But we have new formats. There's connect groups, which anybody can do. And then there's grow groups. You know what? Grow groups are, it's more in-depth Bible study. But not every connect group. Groups aren't all about Bible studies. In fact, the, they're not all about sitting around with 12 or 15 or 20 people. The best group size is four to seven people. All you need to do is grab a couple friends, get an idea for a group, and then open it up to maybe a couple more new friends that God would maybe want to add in. But I want you to go, you can go on the app, scroll down on the app to you find groups or either the community section. Both have a place where it's like, I like to do a group or lead a group. Even if you don't know what, just be open to it. The, the link there will take you to a form. And also you can talk to Next Steps or talk to the info booth about more details. If you want to talk to a human, you can do that. But I want to invite you to, I want you to invite to stand. Let's all stand. And I want to, I want you to close your eyes. I want you to take a moment and have a quiet time with Jesus. Close your eyes. And I want you to pray. And first of all, can we pray? I want you to just, can we pray this prayer together and just say, Jesus, would you move my heart to people like your heart? is moved to people like your heart is moved to community. God, help me to do this. God, I just pray that you would put on a, our hearts, God, how you want this to look, how this could look. And Father, I just even pray for your healing power to come in in every area where there has been. Somebody's gotten quilled. Father, it's been painful. It's been a huge disappointment. It's been a huge letdown. It's been outright really bad. And God, I just thank you for your power to bring healing, your power to bring freedom to every heart that might be in that situation. And God, that our hearts would be able to be free to love with your love and to, Father, to gather as your heart gathers with those, with others. God, we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. And just everyone with your eyes closed, I just want to pray. We're going to pray one more prayer together. And it's a prayer of saying yes to following Jesus. And you know what? Being a part of God's family, man, God, he only has, we're all a part of God's family. I believe there's only two kinds of kids. There's lost kids and there's found kids. And found kids, they know who they are in Jesus. They know what Jesus has done and they were following Jesus and living that out. But you might be a lost kid here today and haven't even realized you're lost. But God loves you so powerfully and he wants more than anything else for you to know how much he loves you and his purpose for you. And you discover that by saying yes and following Jesus. And we're all going to pray a prayer together, just give me language to this. And then there's a lot of other, there's other things you can do after that. Well, what do I do next? But we're going to tell you, but why don't we just pray this together? Say, Jesus, thank you for everything that you've done to save me, to take away my sin and to give me a new start. I say yes to this reality, to following you, Thank you for living through me to release your life and your love to the world that I live in. Amen. Amen. Come on, let's give God praise for what he's doing in people's hearts. We hope today's message encouraged you. If you want to take your next step in saying yes to Jesus, you can always contact us at cty.lc or fill out the next step section on the City Life app. It's an honor as a church to play just a small part in what God is doing in your life. We look forward to seeing you soon here at City Life.